Okay, fantastic, everyone. It is now 7.04 p.m. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I'd like to introduce, uh, welcome everyone to our Distinguished Speaker Series. Um, as many of you know, we do this monthly. And this month, we have the honor of having Dan Maeda with us tonight. Dan is the co-chair of the LA County Citizens Redistricting Commission. Um, and is involved in very important work of working with other commissioners to redraw the lines this year um, for the supervisorial districts. Dan is also a clinical professor, full-time clinical professor at the UCLA School of Law, where he runs the documentary, um, uh, documentary film Legal Clinic. Additionally, Dan is also a practicing attorney with the national law firm of Ballard and Spar. Uh, my name is Truck Moore. I am gonna be the moderator for tonight. I am a principal deputy county counsel with the county council's office of Los Angeles County. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Again, Dan, thank you so much for participating tonight in this. This is a obviously very important process and very important process for a number of our communities in, the, in LA County. Um, so why don't you let me know a little bit about yourself? I mean, I know you're here now in LA County. Where did you originally grow up? Well, first, uh, thank you for this opportunity to help spread the word about the importance of redistricting and how you might play a role in uh, our process of drawing the lines for the five supervisorial districts in LA County. Um, I was born in Tachikawa Air Base, which is uh, just outside, which was just outside of Tokyo in Japan. Uh, I was went to an English speaking school, so unfortunately, mm -hmm. never learned Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, my family moved uh, from there to Gardena when I was about six. Uh, I went to Gardena Elementary, then to schools in North Torrance, graduated from North Torrance High. Um, and then I moved, uh, I lived in the Westwood area when I went to UCLA as an undergraduate, as well as law school. Um, and so that's my living situation. I currently am living in Culver City. Fantastic. So you've got a very long history here in Los Angeles County, and you've lived in a number of areas, and it looks like you've moved in between a number of supervisorial districts um, as you've made your way through um, LA County. So that's fantastic. Um, now, I know you're a lawyer now. We don't have um, as many lawyers entering the profession as we'd like, and that as many as on the bench. So I'm really curious, what, what drew you into the law? Uh, well, I grew up in a traditional Japanese American family where the top profession was to be a doctor. Uh, if not a doctor, maybe a dentist. Uh, number three, my, my, for my mom was an architect for some reason. I don't know why. For my dad, my dad was a CPA. Uh, and so he thought I should get an MBA and uh, do business. Um, no lawyers. We didn't know any lawyers. So I never, that was never a thought in my mind. Um, but I went to UCLA as an undergraduate because I really was interested in media and I figured I didn't know what I wanted to do, but there must be something there. It's big school, lots of majors. Um, and I thought for a, a while that maybe I would get a psych degree and uh, become, become a motivational researcher, try to figure out how to make people buy things that they didn't think they needed. <laughs> uh, I thought that would be kind of cool. Um, but uh, one quarter I took uh, Psych uh, 10 and Com Studies, Communication Studies 10. And I hated the Psych and I loved the Com Studies. And so I pursued that, became a Com Studies major. Um, and then in the course of that, I met some lawyers. I, I had an internship with the ABC Department of Broadcast Standards and Practices. Um, and I asked folks, you know, if I want to get involved in this industry, what should I do? And many of them said, get a law degree. So I started looking more seriously into that. Uh, I eventually decided I wanted to do communications law, which is FCC related work, uh, representing broadcasters and cable companies, people like that. Uh, which is only done in Washington, primarily done in Washington, D.C. So after law school, I moved to Washington and practiced communications law firm, uh, communications law there at a private firm for about three years. Um, but uh, the deal was when I, I had gotten married and, and moved out there, my wife's from San Diego. And the deal was she knew I wanted to do this law. So she said, it's OK to go to D.C., the East Coast but we'd have to figure out a way to come back to California at some point. And um, 
I figured out that after about three or four years of law uh, outside of law, if, after you're practicing for two to four years, you become pretty marketable because I guess the firms feel like you've the rough edges have been knocked off. You know, you've been trained up by somebody else. And now you're, you're, you know, if you've made it, then you could probably move into this other places and uh, not threaten the senior associates because you're coming in, you know, at a, at a lower level and so forth. So I realized that it's probably my best chance to make a move after about three years. So I started sending out resumes and I really got lucky hooking up with the firm that I went with, which was Leopold Petrich and Smith, which is a boutique, which was a boutique Century City litigation firm that practiced in the entertainment and media space. So it had a lot of the subjects I was interested in, but a different form of practice in litigation. Um, and I, I was surprised that I actually liked that. So I stayed there for 30 years and became a wow. partner at the firm there. Uh, and then when I turned 60, I thought, you know, I'm kind of getting tired of this. I want to, you know, look for an exit strategy, something else to do. And around that time, I found out that uh, UCLA Law was starting up this documentary film legal clinic. And I had done some teaching in the past, and I really enjoyed that. And this was an opportunity to teach, as well as to help uh, underrepresented storytellers get their stories out to the public. And I've always been very keen on uh, increasing opportunities and diversity and inclusion representation for people of color, particularly Asian Americans. Uh, and I saw this as sort of a natural extension of this, where I'd help filmmakers, um, you know, especially filmmakers that are underrepresented, uh, get their stories to the public. And so that's what, we, we, what we've been doing, training second and third year law students to represent documentary filmmakers pro bono. Um, and it's, I've been having a blast. It's really a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. It just, it sounds fantastic. And, you know, quite honestly, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's such an honor that, you know, you've made it to the top rungs of the legal profession as a partner, um, but additionally as a, as a law professor, and, you know, that really helps bring out the, uh, you know, to, to show society that, you know, Asians can be attorneys, can be prominent litigators, you know, can be teaching law, you know, so it's, it's just incredible strides. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I want to get to how you got onto the redistricting commission. I mean, obviously you're the co-chair, but before we get there, um, obviously, you know, uh, it's a one, it's a once in a 10 year process. Um, so how did you get on the redistricting commission? So uh, in addition to other things, I'm, I consider myself a political junkie. Uh, I love politics. I, that was one of the things I really loved about DC was uh, and you can talk politics with cab drivers, you know, uh, elevator operators, everybody's got some political angle, you know, it's company town in that sense. And I also did work on the Hill uh, as, a, as a law student and eventually, um, well, it's a long story, but I, I was on the Hill as well. Uh, and so it was really a lot of fun. But I realized that uh, currently there's this giant move to suppress the vote, uh, uh, gerrymandering uh, of districts. There's various ways in which uh, certain, you know, a certain political party is trying to uh, is opposed to democracy, basically, and is trying to do things to prevent people from actually electing the candidates of their choice. And um, so when the opportunity, uh, when, when the possibility came up to join the California, the statewide redistricting commission, I submitted my application. And I don't know if anyone has done that application form, but it's it's the, the most onerous application form I've ever filled out. Anyways, I pursued that and uh, I made it halfway through, but uh, eventually did not uh, succeed. Um, so I thought, okay, that, well, that was, that's it. Uh, but then I got an email from the county saying, you know, hey, do you want to submit your application to join the county uh, citizens redistricting commission? And since I already, had already done the work of filling out the giant statewide application, I just cut and paste my essay answers into the uh, county uh, uh, pr procedure and submitted my application. Uh, and then I kind of forgot about it. Then months later, I get an email saying, congratulations, I'm part of the County uh, Citizens Redistricting Commission. Uh, and you know, so the, I, I was one of the eight uh, candidates selected through a ping pong ball process, basically a lottery process. 
Um, and then the eight of us got together, read the rest of the applications, and then chose six to fill out the 14. And I could, I could talk more about that process if you're interested, but um, that's how I became part of the commission. And then the 14 commissioners, uh, after a couple of meetings, voted to elect a chair, uh, a chair or chairs, and uh, myself and Carolyn Williams, another commissioner, uh, were elected co-chairs. Fantastic. And can you give us a little background on the other four, well, the other 13 commissioners that serve with you? What are their backgrounds? Sure. So uh, just very, very briefly, and I wrote notes because there's so much that's involved. There were 714 applicants uh, for the county uh, CRC. 533 were deemed qualified. Um, the county executive office, I guess, um, somebody, you know, whittled those down to the 60 most qualified, roughly 12 in each supervisorial district. 30-day uh, public comment period, ping pong ball lottery. They select five, one from each of the five districts, and then three more sort of at large. Uh, I was one of the eight. And then the eight review the remaining 52 qualified applications, most qualified applications, to choose six more. We're looking at trying to balance political party, the, the roughly the same uh, percentage as in the county, gender, 50-50, uh, race, geography, and we wanna spread the people around throughout the county and age is another factor as well. Um, it was an extremely long drawn out process. It took us about three meetings or so to debate and figure out who to pick, but we ended up with a uh, situation where 52% of the county is consists of Democrats. So that in terms of 50% of 14 would be either seven or eight Democrats. 30% uh, declined the state or other political party, Green Party, et cetera. Uh, that translates to either four or five and 17% Republicans, which means either two or three. So we had to figure out where the eight was and then figure out where, that, where the holes were, what we wanted to fill. So we ended up initially choosing a total of eight Democrats, two Republicans, and four uh, what we call NDR, not Democrat, not Republican, potentially other parties, although there was really only one uh, person who was, who was a candidate uh, who was not, or not an independent, but in fact, a Green Party candidate. Uh, we ended up with eight males and six females, not, not a perfect 50-50, but pretty close. 46% uh, of the county is uh, Latinx, uh, and that translates to, um, well, we, we ended up with six Latinx commissioners, which is roughly 43%, so it's pretty close. Um, three white commissioners, which is 21.4%, uh, which is close to 25% of the commissioners. Uh, two African Americans, which is close to the number of African Amer percentage of African Americans and other, uh, and Asians. Uh, there's only 15% uh, APIs in the county as of the most recent data. Um, but we ended up with three, which is 21.4%. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of those Asian American commissioners uh, resigned for personal reasons, and so we had an, uh, a, another commissioner slot to fulfill. And based on all the all the information we had, we ended up choosing a another uh, a white woman, uh, and so now there's only two API commissioners. But as you can see, it's reasonably reflective of the diversity of the county, and it, these are uh, the folks are geographically spread as well um, throughout the county, as to the extent one can do so in 14. Right, and I mean it's fantastic to hear that the commission is, you know very much so representative of what LA County looks like um, geographically as well as, you know, ethnically. So it's wonderful to see. Now, did you guys take that up to do that on your own initiative or is that required in the state legislature rules? I believe the legislation uh, sets forth what our goals are. The political party is definitely something that was a statutory requirement to get you know, reasonably close. Um, I don't remember specifically whether the other ones were or not, but we felt, you know, we were very confident that we wanted to reflect the uh, ethnic diversity, gender, obviously, and age was tougher because most of the really qualified folks are gonna, not gonna be in the 30s, right? They're gonna be older. Um, but we have, you know, if you break it up into large bands, we're, we're reasonably um, uh, equal as well there. 
Fantastic. So, I mean, important question. Do you get paid to sit on the commission? We get paid a big zero dollars. Uh, and I have to say, I mean, I'm I'm happy to do it. It's important responsibility. It's taking so much time. It really is a very time consuming process. And we're just, you know, we've done a lot already since December, but uh, the next three months are just going to be, uh, they're, they're going to be crucial because we now have some census data. We're going to get the final census data shortly, along with something called the incarcerated population redistribution data. And we now have available map drawing software for the public. And we're going to start, I'm sure we're going to start receiving maps. We're going to start drawing our own maps. We have to decide everything uh, to some degree by November, put the maps out that we've chosen, uh, some potential maps and have public hearings more public hearings, and then choose, make the final choice by December 15th. That's our statutory deadline. Um, it was We were supposed to have months and months with this data, the census data, but as you might know, it's, the census data has been delayed for months, and so our timeline is, super, is extremely crunched. Uh, last week, I testified before the uh, California legislature to try to plead for more time mm -hmm. for us to get until January 14th, which is what the statewide CRC is asking the California Supreme Court for an extension of time. Uh, their process is different. That's not statutory right. in that way, the deadline at least. Um, and the legislature slapped us down and said, you know, those guys are drawing a hundred districts. You're only drawing <laughs> five. So Thank you for your service, but go back and do your work, you know, so uh, it's December 15th. Now, and, and, you know, I think it's important for, you know, the participants today, as well as for the members of the public to understand that the entire commission is really working for free. Absolutely. So you're just seeing this as your civic duty um, to participate in this process because you really, you're really not getting paid and it is a lot of work, you know, and it does take a lot of time. Yep. And so with that, I'm sure a lot of us are, you know, wondering, well, what's this redistricting process? And, you know, Dan, I'm going to turn that over to you. But before um, I do that, I did want to read um, into the record, um, you know, just some important ground rules for the rest of our um, important talk today, just so everyone's clear. Um, Dan is not able to um, take public input today. Um, the presentation that he's doing is designed to be educational and informative about the redistricting process. Um, he can absolutely answer your questions about the process, you know, and other questions related to the process that you may have. Um, but any input that you have today, any of one who's participating in our call today, um, whether, you know, you, you've heard input from your family, from your friends, or have your own personal input, you know, about how Dan and the um, CRC can draw the lines, he's not able to take those comments today. Um, it has to be shared with the full LA County um, CRC at one of their public hearings. And so he'll be talking about how you can share that important, important information and comments that you have, um, you know, um, that and how you can submit it so that you can get maximum, maximum impact. Um, so I just wanted everyone to know that. Um, and then with that being said, um, Dan, I'm going to go ahead and turn it to you. Thank you, Truck, for that important disclaimer. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, and I'll just uh, reiterate that uh, we are. I am not able to take uh, public input about where you think the lines should be drawn, or what the, you think the various communities of interest are. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a in a second. Uh, let's see. This is kind of hiding my tab here. No, that's not it. Okay. Um, so this is a very short presentation, uh, basics about redistricting. Um, I want to mainly talk to you about the uh, approach we're taking for redistricting this time. It's a new approach in LA County. Uh, in the past, uh, the County Board of Supervisors selected a, their own committee called the Boundary uh, uh, Redistricting Committee, but it was an advisory only process and, and Truck knows about this as well. Um, uh, the committee uh, looked at the census data, the new census data, and proposed uh, redrawing uh, the, the boundaries, adjusting the boundaries. 
Uh, but the supervisors were free to reject um, that committee's findings. Um, now we have a state statute which created this independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. Um, and we are completely independent of the Board of Supervisors. In fact, we have um, bylaws with, that we adopted that actually forbid us, ban us from having any contact with the Board of the Supervisors themselves, their staffs, agents, or families. And if we do inadvertently have such contact, we have to actually report it to the public. Um, so we, we take our independence very seriously. Uh, we've adopted core values to guide our work. Uh, those include things like accountability. We want to obviously be accountable to the citizens of the county as well as to each other. Uh, transparency as much as possible. Do our uh, business in an open and transparent fashion. We want to be objective, uh, intentionally uh, impartial, fair-minded. Uh, we want to do things with integrity to be honest and truthful and to recognize and promote inclusion and equity and to try to eliminate barriers to access to the process that we're undertaking. Um, you could, there's a lot more words to explain what uh, we're going to do. Um, and you could find this slide and other information about redistricting at our website, which is at redistricting.lacounty.gov. Uh, now I want to talk about the significance of LA County and how that impacts the redistricting process. Uh, redistricting is very important, as you know. Uh, every 10 years, the census um, uh, you know, counts the, the, everybody in the United States and where they're located. And people move around, uh, certain areas grow faster than others, et cetera. So various political districts have to be redrawn to reflect that each district of, of the like kind uh, has the same number of people, or roughly the same number of people. So the state uh, CRC, the State Citizens Redistrict Commission, also an independent body, um, they're using census data to redraw boundaries in California for congressional districts, for state assembly districts, for state um, senate districts, and for the uh, Board of Equalization. Um, the city of Los Angeles also has a redistricting process, uh, as well as the uh, LA Unified School District. They're also doing redistricting, again, all based on this census data. But the city and the school board are not independent uh, bodies. Those are, you know, handpicked might sound pejorative, but th those are uh, committees that are picked by the, the incumbents, basically, those folks who are already there, the boards that are already there. Uh, so it's a very different process than the independent board that we have that uh, is going to draw the county districts. And it's, it's the first time that that's ever happened, that we have an independent board. Uh, redistricting, uh, it, it, it determines, it will help determine who the, your representative is if you live in the county. Uh, as you know, uh, each of these county districts uh, has, uh, offers a lot of county services, whether they be health services, various kinds of social services, fire and, and policing through the sheriff's department. Um, these, some of these agencies, the sheriff's department, for instance, um, provides policing services, uh, law enforcement services to the unincorporated areas of the county. And even some cities contract on a, on a contract basis, hire the sheriff to be their police force as well. Um, so all of these things are, make it very important who your supervisor is and each supervisor controls enormous number, uh, enormous amount of resources as well. So uh, that's why redistricting is important because it can help determine who your, you know, your representative is going to be, and uh, what you know your chances are basically of electing the the person of your choice. Uh, Los Angeles County is extremely complex, as you might know since you, since you live here. Uh, it's the most populated county in the United States. A full quarter of California's population resides right here in LA County. Uh, it's the third largest metropolitan economy in the world. Uh, it's comprised of 88 cities and over 100 uh, unincorporated areas. Um, and uh, as a result of its size, uh, that makes it even more important how we divide up the districts and how we draw it up. And as you know, it is one of the most ethnically diverse counties in the United States. What you're seeing here is the current county supervisorial map. Uh, the areas in white are incorporated cities, 
and the areas in red or pink are um, unincorporated areas. Uh, you'll notice right away that just current District 5 is extremely large as compared to say District 2 in the, in the center or District 1. Um, and why is that? Uh, it's because each county has to have roughly the same, I'm, I'm sorry, each district in the county has to have roughly the same number of people. Um, and that's going to be roughly 2 million people. And count, uh, District 5 being more rural and more sparsely populated needs a lot more geography in order to add up to 2 million people as compared to District 2, which is very densely populated in the center of the city. And that's why the, the district uh, geography looks the way it does. We're not required to follow these lines. Obviously, we're in the process of redistricting. We're not, even, we're not required to tinker with the lines. We can draw a completely different map if we want to, if the data uh, provides that, supports that, and if the testimony that we've received supports that as well. We can only draw five districts by law. We can't draw more than five or less than five. Uh, that would require a vote of the, uh, the population, the voters. Uh, just a brief overview about our criteria that we're using to do the redistricting. Uh, we have some statutory criteria that we have to follow um, based on the our state statutes and the constitution, uh, federal law as well. The number one uh, criteria uh, in priority is to draw districts that are reasonably equal in total resident population with each other. We can take a variance of 10%, uh, give or take, between the lowest populated district that we draw and the most populated district, but that's our, our leeway that we have by law. Uh, two, we have to draw districts uh, in such a fashion that it complies with the Voting Rights Act. I'll explain a little bit more about that process in a second. Three, districts have to be geographically contiguous, meaning all parts of the district have to touch each other. Four, we are trying to maintain the geographic integrity of cities, communities of interest, and uh, local neighborhoods. Um, and I'll, again, I'll explain that in a little bit more in a second. And five, to the extent it doesn't conflict with one through four, uh, we have to try to make districts as geographically compact as possible. In addition to these criteria, we're not allowed uh, to favor incumbents or favor, favor or disfavor incumbents or favor or disfavor any political party or any political candidate. So that's uh, the task ahead of us. Um, as I said, we have to make sure that each district has to have a reasonably equal population. We, we know that the census data says that the county is roughly 10 million. Uh, people. So each district has to have roughly 2 million people. Uh, we have to give, we have to make sure we're giving racial and ethnic groups a fair shot according to the Voting Rights Act. What does that mean? Here's a very simplified example, but I think it may, may help illustrate the point. Here we have, uh, a, let's say, a county as an example of, um, there are 16 figures there in the county and four of them are represented to be minorities. Um, you'll see that if you divide the county, this, if this is a county divided into four districts, uh, each of those districts has roughly the same number of people, right? Four uh, symbols representing them. But the way this is drawn, it's the minorities are only one quarter of each of those districts. Uh, and when you, if you draw the lines that way, then the minorities assuming they all vote, uh, or they tend to vote in a certain way, uh, you're, they're not gonna be able to elect the candidate of their choice. So the Voting Rights Act provides that where there can be drawn a majority minority district, if the minority group is geographically compact, politically cohesive, meaning they tend to vote the same in the same fashion, uh, and large enough to be a majority within a district that can be drawn, then we may be required to draw such a district. And in this case, in this simplified example, and if things were only this simple, it'd be, it'd be so much nicer, but uh, this is a, an example, but you see that you can draw a dis this county, a district in the center of the county that is gonna be comprised of about three quarters minorities. Uh, and the other districts have the same number of people, 
but uh, the district in the center will in fact have a majority minority district be able to elect the candidate of their choice. And that may be in fact required by the Voting Rights Act. Um, third, we have to make sure that our, all parts of the district are connected to each other. You see the example on the right side, uh, where you have a piece of a district that's separated completely from the rest of the district, that would not work. That would not be a proper map. Um, fourth, we have to preserve, or we're trying to preserve the geographic integrity of cities, neighborhoods, and communities of interest. What is a community of interest? It could be a city boundary, it could be a neighborhood, but it also could be uh, an area such as, uh, let's say you have a city that uh, does land use planning or regional transportation planning with neighboring cities. In that situation, you could one could say, we wanna keep our city together in the same district with city B and city C, because we're all next to each other and there's common traffic patterns and we have we have shared bus routes or whatever it is, they might argue, or they might, someone else might say, there's this polluting plant in a uh, manufacturing plant nearby and all the cities in that area join together because we want to, uh, you know, we want to be able to regulate the pollution from that plant. So we are a community of interest, all, all our cities together, our areas together. That could be another example. Certainly minority groups could have communities of interest as well. So we've been taking uh, public testimony about communities of interest through a number of public hearings. There'll be more opportunities for that process as well, if you'd like to participate. Um, compactness. Uh, we're not supposed to bypass nearby populations in drawing districts. We're supposed to try to be compact. Uh, the example on the far left is a relatively compact district. The district on the right is kind of dispersed. It has this finger coming out to join two larger areas. That's not very compact. That's not preferred uh, as a way to draw. The one in the middle is somewhat in between, right? There's a mass in the middle and then some, you know, areas that come out a little bit. Um, not the best, you know, it'd be better if it could be more uh, compact with less like, you know, octopus tentacles coming out basically. Um, but, you know, it's hard to tell without more information if this one or this one actually is a violation of law. Uh, it's just that this would be the goal. The more compact one would be the goal. Um, and then uh, we are supposed to avoid partisan uh, favoritism. Uh, so where you draw the lines matters. And this is again, a very simplified example, but on the left-hand side, you've got a diagram which shows that uh, uh, the 50 precincts, 60% are yellow and 40% are green. So if these were political parties, then you'd have you know two thirds of them um, would be a certain party and one third of the, a different party. In the middle, you can draw districts uh, evenly so that each district has the same number of precincts, uh, but you can draw it in such a way so that yellow would win most of the time or you know all the time because they would outnumber the greens. Uh, on the right side, uh, let's say the greens were in control of the process, they could draw these boundaries and they create districts where green would win three, three times and yellow would win twice. That seems unfair because uh, in terms of the population, green is really outnumbered, but that would be a way to gerrymander the districts or draw the districts in such a way as to purposely cause greens to win. Um, there's other ways to draw it, obviously. You could draw it uh, at the, the diagram in the middle here. Uh, it'd be an odd linear uh, district, but you could do it so that, you know, three quarter or two thirds of the district uh, are yellow and one third is green. You could draw it differently so it'd have the same kind of um, uh, result. Again, these are super simplified uh, districts. We're never gonna have something as clean as this but it shows you in general how one can manipulate the process to favor a political party. We're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to favor or disfavor a party. So how can you get involved in, in the district redistricting process? We're, we have a number of uh, public hearings. We've already had several. There's a couple more coming up, which I'll talk about. Um, we've just uh, released free mapping software 
very, very powerful software you can uh, download, or it's actually, it's an online process you can access. We're, we're going to have training sessions, and it's actually kind of fun to play around with. If you, if you have any interest in mapping or maps in general, or if you just want to see for yourself, what would it be like to create certain kinds of districts and, and just, you know, perhaps you'll come up with a great idea we hadn't thought of, and you could submit that map for our input. Um, so there's opportunities to, to get involved. And again, more information is at our website, redistricting.lacounty.gov. If you provide your email address to that website, you'll be getting a slew of email uh, that will come about all of the, the things that are happening, public hearings. I'm in my campus office and it has an automatic uh, thing that light that turns off. So I might have to wave occasionally to get that uh, light to come on. Um, but you'll be able to participate, uh, learn more about what you can do to participate by uh, going to the website. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, two more public hearings. Uh, they're going to be hybrid, meaning uh, we'll be some of us will be there in person, but we'll, you can also participate virtually. And you don't have to be uh, part of these communities to participate and about about any. You can provide us input about any community. The next one is September 22nd in the San Fernando Library. Uh, in the city of San Fernando, and then um, the next one after that, September 29th, in a uh, county library in Bellflower. Uh, we deliberately chose those two locations because, and we have been spreading out our, our public hearings in various areas, but we wanted to choose locations where potentially there were people who might not have as much access to technology so they can actually show up in person to provide input. Uh, again, information like this is at our website. We have toolkits. If you really are interested in helping us spread the word, uh, we have toolkits in 12 different languages. Uh, so you can recruit folks to get involved. Uh, again, signing up at the website. Uh, if you show up to a public hearing, please wear your mask. Uh, here's the list of our commissioners, uh, chair and co-chair. Uh, Carolyn Williams, African-American, uh, as is Commissioner Jean Franklin. Um, and you can see various other, uh, we have Latino, uh, Latin, Latinx commissioners. Uh, Darina Wong is another uh, commissioner. Uh, here's the chart of the LA County staff. Uh, we have an executive director, independent legal counsel, et cetera. Um, now, one other thing I wanted to show you but uh, this is not letting me do it easily. Maybe if I do this. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, here's the free public uh, uh, a workshop on how to use the free software, redistricting software, Thursday, September 9th, a week from tomorrow, 11 o'clock, uh, you can Go, this is uh, on our website, you can find it, but uh, there's information about how you can join a workshop, a seminar to learn how to use this software. Again, it's super uh, powerful, comprehensive. You can put all kinds of filters in to find ethnicity, cities, uh, every other criteria you can think of. But um, uh, if you do have ideas, uh, you think you, you want to see a district in a certain way or you want certain areas to be together uh, and you want to provide that input to us, I encourage you to do so. I think, um, I think what you will find is it's really a difficult job. You can have a great idea about doing something in a certain area, a certain district. Uh, but the problem is, is that you're not done once you create a district of 2 million, right? You have to figure out what are the other districts look like. We can't just have, we're not done if we don't submit one district. We have to actually draw all five. And sometimes putting stuff in a certain district or taking things away from a district dramatically changes everything else, the ethnic you know, makeup, uh, whatever it is that might, might be. Um, and it's um, so it, it, it will be fun if you like that kind of thing. And certainly we would encourage uh, any great ideas from the public as individuals or as organizations. I know various organizations, uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Los Angeles, uh, there's various Latino organizations, there's others who are very interested in this process and will be providing uh, maps to us for our consideration. So. Fantastic. Yeah, I and I had heard from um, a friend today who had actually 
fiddled with the software program and you know it's a lot <laughs> it's a incredible but you know very big tool and you're correct i mean you're where you draw one um, district you're gonna have to balance out the others and that was always the case even 10 years ago and you know every 10 years before that you know now you know thank you for the presentation i i had a question for you you know i see that there's 14 commissioners um as you guys are going to undertake the process to draw the maps are you voting um together or because i mean what if you have a perfectly even split uh you know how are you breaking your ties on on decisions that you're making um, so, talk yeah. about that uh, so so far we have not had any decisions that have gone to a seven seven tie um uh, of course we haven't had to make the really, really tough decisions yet. That's still to come. Uh, we've been doing some of our work in working groups, uh, figuring that, you know, trying to do everything with 14 people all the time. Uh, it doesn't, you know, there's, there's too much to do basically. So we have some working groups. So we're in the process now of, of expanding, creating and expanding a uh, mapping working group uh, that's gonna be comprised somewhere between six to eight commissioners. Um, who are going to be doing a lot of uh, the work of uh, taking in the maps that the public submits, uh, instructing our mapping. We have an expert uh, demographer uh, who's helping us map with mapping. We instruct the demographer, you know, why don't you try this? How about this idea? We have a voting rights council. It's a voting, they're doing voting polarization analysis, which is figure out if in fact uh, certain minority groups tend to vote a certain way and if if and when they do so are is it polarized so that let's say the white community votes for one type of you know, for one candidate or minority groups or certain minority groups might vote for a different candidate that's polarization and if that happens that's a factor we have to take into account when we are trying to comply with the voting rights act um uh, anyways this 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 group is going to be trying to uh, this working group is going to try to sort of group kinds of maps together. So at, just as an example, uh, there's we've been receiving a lot of community of interest uh, community of interest input about the San Fernando Valley. What do we do about the San Fernando Valley? Uh, so to back up one step, uh, which I probably should have mentioned, city of Los Angeles has four million people, okay? I, I had said that we try to keep the cities together. Well, obviously, except for Los Angeles, we cannot keep Los Angeles together. By itself, it's more than four, you know, more than two million, right? Uh, it's not even clear we're going to be able to do it in two districts. Probably not. So we're going to have to split up LA in some way. Okay. So what do we do with the valley? Um, so we've had some input from the community saying. The valley should be, you keep the valley together. The entire valley has to be together. Okay. So one question is, well, what is the valley? Because some people's definition do not go to Calabasas on the west or to, I'm not sure where to be on the, on the east, Toluca Lake or something. You know, where does it go? And then north and south, it's, there's not clear boundaries, right? So that's one question. But someone else would say, well, no, no. The Reseda and other parts of the valley, they're more working class. We don't want to be with Calabasas and Malibu and those folks. We want to be in a different district. Okay, so you can't have both, right? We, we can't follow both of those principles. So one group of maps might keep the valley together, whatever that might mean. Another group might split it up. That, that's a possible way to divide things. And there's certainly plenty of other ways to divide things. Um, so that group is going to help us sort through and then bring various ideas to the full commission at a public notice, publicly noticed meeting, and the full commission will vote, this is the direction we want to go in, or we need more maps that look like this, or, or whatever it is, until ultimately we're going, to have to, we're going to have to make the tough choice to say, these are the three maps that we want to present, as an example, three maps that we want to present to the public, uh, for public hearing and have them, have the public have a chance to take a shot at it. You know, yes, we like this one, we hate this one, or this one's okay, but only if you do this, you know, tinker around with it. And then after that, then we have to decide and pick one and that's it. That's gonna be our choice. Um, 
If it's seven, seven, then we're in a world of hurt because we need to come up with, we need to have nine. Our, our quorum and our vote has to be nine. So we're going to have to at least have nine. But, you know, as a good chair of anything, I'm striving for 100%. I want consensus. You know, I want to bring everybody around mm -hmm. to agree this is the map. This is the best one, if we can. Um, but whatever it is, we've got to be done by December 15th. So that's that's the challenge. Well, we'll be watching to see if you guys can get that consensus. And obviously, that would be best for the county you know, if, you know, everyone who was tasked to do this was in full agreement that this was perfect for the map. Um, Absolutely. We have a very good question that is related to what you just discussed. But before we get there, I want to make sure that I understand um, the issue of any potential bias. So are any of the um, commissioners, uh, political appointees, um, members, of like the establishment of the Republican or Democratic Party, or you know, what are their what are their professions? So excellent question. We are the, the screening process to become a qualified member. You know, be qualified to be on the commission was intense. The conflict of interest stuff was really really intense. So neither uh, any of the commissioners nor our spouses or significant others, anybody in our families. I forgot if it goes to, you know, aunts, uncles, but it's uh, certain family members are encompassed within the conflict of interest. We can't have been a candidate, uh, a um, uh, currently or in the past, I don't know, 10 years or something, uh, have worked on the staffs of a political office uh, I mean, there's just various kinds of, of, I don't even remember it anymore what they were, but the various kinds of screenings so that, uh, you know, we don't have that issue of a, like a direct familial or ourselves being candidates, potential candidates, you know, former candidates or, um, or on staffs. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, many of us are political people. We, we love politics. You know, we like politics. That's why we're, we're doing what we're doing. Uh, they can't, they didn't, you know, did not, uh, and it wouldn't be advised, I don't think, to screen out anyone who has inter interest in politics, because then there's not going to be any commitment to doing the hard work, because this is, this is a lot of work. Um, but nobody is, uh, so far that I've been able to, that I've seen, uh, nobody is, uh, you know, everybody's listening, everybody's open-minded, everybody's thinking about these issues, and we're, we get along pretty well. So far. Fantastic. Okay. So here's a very big and important related question. I mean, you had discussed that, you know, once you, you know, publish some draft maps, you're going to put it out for public comments, and then you're going to vote and eventually pick a map. So right. what happens after the final map is adopted by the CR and people are unhappy? Um, let's see if it's, you know, an individual, if it's an organization, or maybe even a board supervisor, right? Um, what's, are they allowed to challenge the CRC and, you know, what's, what's that process, um, of challenging? Can they file a lawsuit? Um, do they sue you? Oh, do they sue the CRC? Do they sue the state? Do they sue the board of supervisors? I mean, what is, what does that look like if people are ultimately unhappy and believe that they have been disenfranchised in some way? Okay. Good question. So, uh, Will people be unhappy with what we do? Guaranteed, people will be unhappy because you cannot make everybody happy. There's not a possible way. If we had, you know, if we could draw 30 districts, you know, maybe we can get a little closer to making people happy because we could do a lot of different things, but we can't, we can only draw five. Uh, so we are gonna make some people unhappy. I, ideally, we're gonna, make most of the people happy or at, at a minimum, make people feel like they were heard, that we considered what they had and what their, their ideas were. Uh, we seriously evaluated their maps if they submitted them, et cetera. Uh, okay, so we're done. We do the maps. Someone is unhappy. What can they do? So you can, you can file a lawsuit you know, to try to overturn the map, okay? It, that is possible to do. Uh, number of questions. One is standing. Um, you know, I don't want to go into what whether they might have standing or not, might not have standing. 
maybe that's not a big big issue if you're a resident or voter of, in the county. Um, but what are the grounds? Now, most lawyer, lawyers will tell you the easy ground, if they're, you know, the easiest ground, easier ground, I guess, uh, would be if there's a procedural deficiency, the, the procedural defect. The statute says we have to hold a certain number of public hearings. The statute says uh, the, once we have the maps, we have to have a minimum of two public hearings, 30 days apart. Um, what if we don't do that? What if we only have one public hearing? Then that's easy. Then you file a lawsuit. You didn't have the you know two public hearings as required by law. This map is no good. That's easy. Of course, we're going to follow the law, right? That's not. We're not going to give you an easy way out that way. We're going to be in compliance with the statute. Uh, but if there was some arguable defect, that would be you know one of the grounds. What about if you don't think that these two communities should have been together, or they sh you, they're not together and they should have been together, or you know or something like that? Good luck. I mean, that is that's going to be a very tough challenge, I would think. Um, what about a Voting Rights Act challenge? You know, somebody says, and maybe it's a it's a interest group says, we think you should have drawn a district to allow my community to be the majority and to, you know, so we could have elected the person of our choice. That's the basis for the, for the um, lawsuit. Okay, then that, you know, there, there are voting rights challenges to maps, you know, every time that this kind of thing is done, uh, there's procedures for that and you, and you pursue it. We're going to have, we have independent legal counsel. We have voting polarization analysis consultants. We have experts on our side. We're confident, I, I'm confident that whatever map we draw is gonna withstand challenge, but someone might disagree and challenge and that that's their right to, to, to try that. Finally, I, as I understand it, there is a possible referendum that the people, enough people can uh, mount uh, gathering a lot of signatures in a short period of time to try to overturn the map. That really tough, really, really tough to get that many signatures to, to do that. But that's another thing you can do. But there's no way that the Board of Supervisors can disagree, adopt a different map or whatever. We're independent. We decide they have to live with it pretty much. Fantastic. And it just, so I'm clear then, it sounds like then the really where we want to make the most impact any organization or community group or, you know, neighborhoods or communities, um, we really want to make the impact right now during the public comment process. That this is the time. Okay, fantastic. So let me ask you this. Uh, can you give us an idea or examples of the type of comments that you've been receiving this far as part of the public process? Sure. So I, I mentioned one uh, or, or two sets of comments uh, about the valley, right? Keep the valley together. No, 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 no. Split up the valley in a certain way. That's that's an example. Um, we, we heard some comments with really interesting comments uh, in the San, uh, in the Antelope Valley. We had a public hearing in, in live, uh, live public hearing in uh, Lancaster and uh, you know, quite a drive to get out, out there, but they were really very excited because people don't go visit them, right? And in the county, and we went out there, uh, a number of commissioners went out there to meet with the, to have a public hearing. And most people who talk about communities of interest say, this is my community and I want to belong, I wanna be in the same district as these neighboring areas. Uh, and in fact, uh, in Santa Clarita, for instance, they said, we want to be part of the North County districts. That's make sure that you include the North County people with us. We have regional interests in common, et cetera. Okay, fine. Some of these uh, Lancaster folks were saying, the, we, don't, we don't think it's right that we all are in one district. And we have, that means we have one supervisor. And every time she goes to advocate for us, she only has one vote. And so as an example, it's very interesting. They said, uh, she said, we need more money for snow plows. And the response by some of the other members was, LA County, we don't need snow plows. And they're like, 
you don't have any idea what North County is like. We need snow plows in North County, right? And so they, they said, don't divide it up north-south, divide it up, you know, vertically <laughs> so that there's slices of North County in various members' districts. Some of you even said in every member's district, okay? You can't do both. You could, you could try that. I don't know what the map would look like. You could try it. Um, but you can't do that and also keep the North County communities together, like other people said. So one way or the other, somebody's going to be unhappy, right? Whichever, whatever way we do it. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but, you know, there, there, we've received all kinds of public comment and we are, uh, you know, cap, we've captured all of that. Again, fully transparent. It's all on our website. Uh, you can go to the website, add your own if you want, you know, review what everybody else said. Uh, but we're going to be incorporating all of those things into various maps for our consideration. Um, and um, anyways, so. Wow, that's really unique that they are, you know, their comments are focused around, you know, the need for snow plows. But that just highlights that the public comment process is so important because it allows everyone to kind of share the things that are important to them so that you can take it into consideration. Um, now, we have a question from a member asking, um, you know, for the communities and groups that, you know, want to um, opine or weigh in on being in the same district. I mean, what is the best way for them to get effectively to the CRC? Should they be doing individual public comments, it sounds like? Should they be going, sending individual letters? Should they do, you know, a big paper with a study and have a whole bunch of people sign off on it? I mean, what's what's the, the right way to do this to make the best impact with the CRC? So we are accepting uh public input in every way that one could give us public input. Uh, certainly you can go to a public hearing either in person or hybrid, you know, online and tell us what, what's on your mind. You can submit, you can fill out a comment card. We have electronic comment cards or, or physical comment cards if you show up in person uh, and write it out. If you don't want to talk, you can just write it out and submit it. Um, you can go online and submit on, on our, at our website. You can submit maps. You can use the, the drawing tools or, or not. You don't even have to use the drawing tools. You could just tell us or get yourself a map and just you know pencil it out, even if it's not exact, the, with the general ideas behind what you feel the community should look like, the map should look like. Um, you could uh, hook up with an organization that is already studying these issues, like such as Asian Americans Advancing Justice. So ver various of the, every meeting that we have uh, as a commission is publicly noticed, compliance with the Brown Act, uh, you know, more than 70, 72 hours at a minimum ahead of time. Uh, our agendas are all posted, our PowerPoint with all the, you know, backup data, reports, et cetera. It's all available online. All of our past meetings are recorded. You can go watch, um, you know, the, the meetings, the procedures. Um, but anyways, I, I mentioned that because I, to say that several interest groups have been attending our meetings regularly since January, basically. And Asian Americans Advancing Justice is one of those groups that has been regularly attending, not every single time, but many meetings. Um, and I know they're planning to, uh, if not draw, they're probably planning to draw maps. But if not, then at least uh, they have been providing uh, avenues for people to submit their, their comments. And definitely various Latino groups have been doing the same thing, organizing their community to submit comment, individual public comments, showing up to the public hearings and so forth. Uh, we, we did have one innovation that's never been done before in the county is to have a Spanish language work, uh, public hearing, an entirely... Uh -huh. Uh, in Spanish, although we had translators into English for those non-Spanish speakers like me, mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's never that's never been done in the county, uh, as far as we know. And so uh, that's an innovation. We'll probably do another Spanish language public hearing once we have the final maps uh, to look at. Um, so there are many different ways. You do not have to do a white paper or you know. A, comprehensive study of anything you just have an opinion that's fine we'll take that and we'll incorporate that into the extent we can 
And do you suggest or have folks been going to, I mean, it sounds like um, Asians, Americans are for advancing justice are going to multiple meetings, but are, do you find that, you know, folks who submit public comment consistently or go to meetings consistently or speak out consistently are able to um, kind of put their point, you know, a little bit fresher in the minds of the commissioners or is every comment treated very equally? every comment treat well the comments are treated equally in the sense that each individual comment is important but if 30 people are telling us one thing you know the same like consistent message 30 30 people about a particular area and no one is or maybe one person is saying something different we'll we'll look at that one person's thing but pretty much the community is telling us something different like don't do what that one person says, you know, the 30 of uh, the, the rest of us are all saying the same consistent direction. That, that's why the, the Antelope Valley one was so surprising. That was so une unexpected to us. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, some, definitely some of the commissioners are going to want to look at, the, I mean, I, I'm going to want to look at that, see if it can be done or anything can be done along those lines. Um, and, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see. I'm sure some of those folks will submit maps to us that will reflect some of those things. And we're gonna, you know, take a good hard look at those. Right, and, and you know, what can, do you think members of the public can expect, you know, from this, this redistricting process? Because I mean, clearly you can't draw more districts um, than what's there. And, you know, you're not allowed to have octopus districts. And so what, what do you think you know, and of course, you know, you're still, the CRC is still hard at work doing this, but I mean, what is going to be the likely result um, at the end of this process? Are we going to see massive drastic changes or, I mean, what is, what do you think could likely happen? So uh, I don't know what will happen. Uh, I will say anything can happen because we literally are not constrained uh, to get close to what we have now. On the other hand, it, it does. It, I'm sure that we will want to consider a map that doesn't do drastic changes. I mean, you know that that it's not. It's not as if these maps that we currently have are so ridiculous that no one would ever want to replicate something like that, right? No, I don't know that, it, maybe someone would say that, but um, uh, you know, one possibility is to tinker around the edges. I suppose that's, that's quite possible. I don't know, no one has proposed it yet, but it's possible. Um, there are gonna be some tough, interesting choices about where to, you know, the valley is an example. Where, where's that? Gonna, where's the split going to be with that? Long Beach. Do we keep Long Beach together or do we divide it? That's a big city. It's not two million though, so in theory, you can keep it all together, or maybe not. But it's a live question yes. about whether we should have a coastal district that goes from Santa Monica down the coast, not including certain cities like Culver City, but you know, down the coast. Uh, down to Rancho Palos Verdes, up San Pedro, Long Beach, mm -hmm. out to wherever that District 4 goes, out into the San Gabriel Valley. Is that the right answer? I don't know. So I, I'm sure some people are going to tinker with that, say, no, that we shouldn't do it that way. Um, but it's, it's all going to be part of the process that the CRC is going to undertake to draw what they think is right um, and will work. Right. I mean, we're, we'll draw our own maps, but we're also going to definitely consider other people's maps. It may well be that, you know, I, I mean, probably, I'm just guessing, but probably one of the maps is going to be something the public gave us, and then we tinker around with it a little bit, and then we'll say, this is, this is what we like. I assume. I assume that, that odds are that somebody in the public is going to come up with something that will say, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, now, um, so you, you're you gonna put out a couple of maps, it's, it sounds like, um, for public consideration. And when you put out a, the couple of maps for public consideration, are you going to identify that there's a likely um, 
one that you're looking at or are you putting it out for public comment for consideration so that you can get an understanding? Uh, I don't think the commission has decided that, uh, mm -hmm. but what we're gonna label them or how we're gonna characterize them. My guess is that it will be hard enough to get nine or 14 of us to say, these are the two or three or four maps that we want to go to the public with, rather than say, this is our number one choice and number two choice. I mean, that that's asking a lot of the commission. I don't think we're going to do that. I think we're going to come up with enough different ideas, but sort of in a general group sense, to say, these are the ideas that we have for maps. What do you all think? And we'll find out. Some, I'm sure each of them will be attacked one way or another, but we may find out in the hearing process that uh, a lot of folks really like this one idea, but maybe it should be refined by doing certain things. Or can you combine the ideas of these two maps and change it a little bit? Yeah, that's possible too. Now, once you get to consensus on one map, um, I have a question here that, you know, what, after the, you get to that consensus, are you going to be able to timely do public comment and to consider that public comment in time to make any final adjustments? Or is the process gonna be that once you get to the final map, that's it? Well, the process, I think the process is gonna be at the end, by the end of, this is a, our, our goal, I think would be at the end of, no, uh, end of October, uh, the commission decides on, as an example, uh, don't hold me to this because the commission hasn't actually decided, but as an example, three maps, let's say, or three kinds of maps, okay, but, but let's say they've decided these are the maps we want to go to the public with, map A, B, and C. Uh, no intention to say A is preferred because it's A, it's just three different maps. Um, then we hold a public hearing. We, we announce the maps, we hold a public hearing November 1st as an example. We have to wait 30 days uh, or, or we have to have another public hearing uh, no earlier than 30 days. So then we have another public hearing, let's say November 31st or no November 30th, okay? Um, in between, we're probably going to have more public hearing. We're, we're going to have more than two. We're required to have two. We're probably going to have more than two, okay? So we have a couple more. Um, we're going to get input all along the way. At the, after we have the three maps and a lot of comments, okay? Then we have 14, 15 days after that for the commission, the nine of us, or the 14 of us, uh, to get nine of us at least to agree, this is the map, or let's adopt this map. So what happens in that time period? <laughs> is going to be a lot of pain as we wrestle with all the comments that have been made, the maps, can we just accept map B and tinker around with it a little bit and reflect the comments and make it better? Can we do that? Or do we throw out that one? And, you know, so that's the process we're going to have to go through to come up with the final until we finally adopt it on, probably on December 15th, our deadline. Right. Uh, and, is that and enough more. time? No, it, we would like to have more, but we won't, we don't, they won't give us more. So, yeah. And, and I recognize that, I mean, you've got, you know, the winter holiday coming up and then you've got the Thanksgiving holiday in between your critical deadlines, you know, and so it's, it's tough, you know, so, you know, to all the folks out there who are listening and want to submit public comment, don't be dissuaded by the Thanksgiving holiday, please fully, fully participate and get your comments into the, the CRC because, you know, clearly it's, it's very so, so important. So I, I want to make it clear. So right now you can give us a uh, community of interest comments. You can also begin submitting maps because the, the map making software is available. Uh, and you should, if you're, in, you're really interested, submit maps to us throughout this process until, you know, throughout, October, basically. At some point, late October, early November, we're going to decide on our choices, okay, including after considering what you, the public, is, is giving us, as well as all the information we've been able to gather. 
Then when we release the maps, then you'll want to scrutinize those maps that we've said are the ones we're considering and tell us that you like one of them, that you dislike others, that you like this one okay, but it needs to be changed. You know, tell us whatever input you can have. That's extremely important because then you, you have something very concrete to react to, right? Um, but at the end of that process on the last public hearing, we're pretty much done with public comments. Then we just have to decide. Okay, great. And, and so, I mean, it sounds like we're really suggesting that everyone should be continue to be engaged, you know, submit their comments now, submit their comments to the maps, you know, and submit their comments to the final map. Um, now, I, I understand that you, you know, it's still unclear on what the public is likely to see, but it sounds like the commission is very heavily weighing all of the public comment that's coming in. Is that correct? We're committed to re, you know, evaluating, reading, categorizing, incorporating every public comment. Okay, fantastic. Now, and, and all those public comments are available for review on our website. Fully okay. transparent process. So I would be able to review every email that you got, um, every phone call that was dictated out as a note, um, every map that's submitted, every correspondence. So every map submitted, yes. Uh, if, if a correspondence was submitted in connection with a public hearing or before a meeting or something, that's all provided as well. Uh, and when you say you know, every recorded conversation or, or every email, you, you, I don't think we're providing the actual email so you can see someone's email address or whatever, or, you know, I don't think we're providing hard copy or scanned copies of those. What we're doing is giving you the data that's on those, that that's community of interest related. That's somewhere that's captured, yes. Okay, fantastic. And, uh, you know, as, a, as an API in LA County, um, you know, how do you view the importance of the redistricting process? And if you could share anything that you're comfortable speaking about, because obviously we recognize that, you know, you have to maintain your impartiality. But do you have any thoughts to share on that? So it, it, Asian, Asian American, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians in LA County are a very large group, right? Um, a very large minority group, and, and also the fastest growing uh, minority group, uh, ethnic group, uh, very important in the life of the county, right? Politically, as well as otherwise. Um, of course, there are other groups. Latinos are a huge part of the county, right? Um, are smaller, but very significant part of the county. And then, of course, the white population is still very large as well. Um, each of those groups is important. Each of them might have different, uh, you know, uh, thoughts, desires, perhaps voting in a certain way. Uh, our voting polarization analysis, analysis consultant will tell us. It's not, uh, I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen anything, any reports from them yet, uh, but it's not necessarily a given that uh, African-Americans are voting in a certain way or Latinos are voting a certain way or Asians are voting a certain way. And we know uh, that uh, within the Asian-American community, certain Asian-American ethnic subgroups are more conservative than other groups, right? We know that. Um, does that, how does that translate to the county? I don't know. I mean, they're, the and analysts are looking at county election data, right, specifically. Um, how people voted for a particular candidate in the county. Uh, do the, does the Asian vote in that sense as a whole look different than the white vote or the Latino vote? I don't know. Um, those are factors. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to say more than that. I mean, clearly we are interested in how the districts are going to affect, are going to affect political, the, the political opportunity of uh, various minority groups to elect the candidate of their choice. Definitely we're concerned and interested in that. Uh, but we need facts. We need, we need, you know, not just anecdotes or suppositions or whatever. We need factual data that supports whatever it is we're going to be doing in order to be able to defend the maps against a potential Voting Rights Act challenge, which is nothing to sneeze at. We, I, 
I would not, I don't want to be the co-chair of a commission whose map was successfully attacked on voting rights grounds, right? That, that would be a horrible legacy for me to leave. I don't want to be that person. So well, we're going to exactly. And, and on yeah, the we're first ever. Can, so that doesn't happen. Exactly. And on the first uh, ever CRC. And, you know, getting back to um, the, any challenge by the Voting Rights Act, I mean, so uh, the, who provides the funding for the CRC right now and all the consultants are using? And then I imagine, and, you know, maybe it's, it's unclear, but who's providing all the funding for, you know, any, you know, future potential litigation and, and, and things like that? Is that coming out of the state legislature pockets or is there an amount to be up from the county? So um, the county is providing the initial funding for the CRC um, back in the fall, I guess, of last year, or maybe the summer of last year, sometime last year. Um, they allocated a certain amount of money. Uh, they hired a consultant who was supposed to rep- you know, be uh, our person, our executive, uh, um, to help us run the commission. Um, we've already gotten to the point where we've, we've had to ask for more money because this thing's costing, you know, there's a lot more that what that was involved than we anticipated. Um, and that money then also goes to pay the demographer and also goes to pay the voting rights people. Now, there is also a process where the county is asking the state to reimburse the county for some of these expenses because it's an unfunded mandate, basically. The state is saying, you need to do this county, right? Um, and so, but I understand that's a really long involved process before the state will in fact reimburse the county. But I know that's going on as well. Uh, when you say uh, who's financing litigation, are you saying the litigation where the county would defend itself or the, or the CRC would defend itself? Yeah, the CRC would defend itself. I mean, obviously if the CRC reaches consensus and has 100% um, votes of the commissioners to pass a map, um, you know, that seems to indicate, you know, consensus um, of, uh, for a proper map. If someone were to challenge that, um, who, who pays, who defends the CRC and who pays for that? So we would look to the county to uh, give us, the, the give CRC the money to defend its map. Um, uh I mean, yeah, I mean, that's it. We don't have our own independent source. Certainly none of us are reaching into our pockets. So the county is going to have to do it. There's no insurance. County's self-insured. So the county will have to, to defend it. Right. Now, so you get your work done. You guys draw a beautiful map. Um, everything looks Everyone's happy. Um, what happens to the CRC? Uh, we suppose... I. Well, that's a good question. I think the state CRC is supposed to last for, you know, nine more years until 2030 census. And there's a new CR, a new state CRC. I don't know exactly whether we're supposed to actually continue to be or not. It doesn't really matter because there, there's not going to be anything for us to do. Not like, you know, at the five-year mark, we check in to see how our map did. You know, we're, we're done. We, we have one job get the job done and then that's pretty much it so uh we'll probably have big big parties you know reunions of our of our commission but other than that you know we're pretty much going to be done and since we're not paid it doesn't really matter <laughs> <laughs> well you know we we absolutely appreciate your efforts i know we've been getting um questions throughout i want to open it up to um anyone else who has a question for dan um, that hasn't been covered in our conversation today. Do we have any further questions from anyone? Checking our chat here. Okay, I don't see anything. Well, you know, we are almost at the end of our 8.30 allotted time. Um, I really enjoyed this because I did get to see how this was done 10 years 
go. And, you know, I'm getting to see it now. And it's, you know, it's just really amazing to see it. It's a different process. And, you know, we appreciate, Dan, you being able to come and speak to us tonight. I know there's a lot of interested groups and a lot of interested folks who are trying to maximize the impact of any public comment that they'll be submitting um, to the CRC. And so it was just really important for people to understand what the process will look like, what your job is, what the CRC's job is, you know, and so I really want to thank you for, for coming today and speaking to us on that. It was wonderful. So I really appreciate that. Do you have any last thoughts for anyone? So I just want to thank you, Truck, for the interesting conversation and thank the LA County Asian American Employees Association for your interest in this. Um, I hope I've conveyed to some extent that this is a process that you can provide meaningful input and I hope you will do it. I hope you'll take advantage of that. Uh, we'd love to see if there's some really interesting, great maps uh, that you wanna provide, that would be, that'd be great to do. Uh, if nothing else, just to be aware that there is a process going on to make a good faith effort to draw districts that are gonna be uh, the most fair and most uh, uh, provide the most mm -hmm. opportunity for folks to feel like they're being heard and uh, selecting the representative of their choice. Um, and um, if we could do that, then that would be something we would be very pleased with. Great, fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for participating in our monthly Distinguished Speaker Series. Um, we'll be back at this again next month. And then yeah. thank you so much again.